this building has history with it. It, it just by its mere existence. Everybody has some recollection of the Cotton Club, of what it used to be, of how it can impact the community. That was all part of the, the fabric of the community. Uh, this was a, a spot to come. Blues and jazz have long been integral to the American cultural landscape and have profoundly changed art and music around the world. But before the music belonged to the world, it was born in the black American community, heard in the field hollers of farm laborers and in the segregated concert halls and juke joints where blacks could freely congregate. One of those concert halls was in Gainesville, Florida, the Cotton Club. It still stands today and soon it will come alive again as the Cotton Club Museum and Cultural Center, dedicated not just to black music, but to the black experience in Alachua County. Our goal today is to make sure people know it as a um, uh, museum and cultural center. So instead of just Cotton Club, it's Cotton Club Museum and Cultural Center. And that more speaks of what we're trying to do in terms of turning this into a community resource. It will be a place for maintaining objects of history of telling the history of African Americans in Gainesville. My hope is that once the project is, is, is complete, that it will be a, a asset to not only the neighborhood, but to the entire community. Uh, it's gonna bring um, an aspect uh, to life that, uh, that Gainesville presently doesn't have. Gainesville has a lot of things to offer, but it doesn't have an African American museum and, and cultural center. Uh, but it also is, is, is a legacy. Every time I pass by the building, uh, you, you have a sense of pride. You know that there's going to always be a sense of cultural awareness. When all of us are, are gone, you will still have an entity. You will still have a building that represents a cultural awareness that money just can't buy. The building wasn't always a music hall, home for jazz and the blues. It began its life at Camp Blanding in Stark, built by soldiers in 1940 or 41, as a postal exchange store for servicemen during World War II. Well, the PX at that time was no bigger than our barracks, and just a, a one-story little building, and uh, they had uh, just candy bars, cigarettes, beer, and that was about it. Just when we got in out of the field in the evening while everybody was wanting to cool off, so we visited quite often to have a beer. It brings back a lot of memories for these World War II veterans because they were here when these buildings were in use originally. And it's important for us to save them for, you know, because of those memories that it, it, it brings back for them. There's a lot of heritage there and it's a lot of sentimental value in, in a lot of these buildings as well. And I think it should be preserved for, for future generations to see what went on in, during that period. It's history. Mm -hmm. And if you don't learn history, you repeat things. When Camp Blanding closed in March of 1946, at the end of the war, the building was one of 3,000 put up for sale. Gainesville grocers William and Eunice Perryman, who owned a grocery store on what was then called East Depot or Cecil Avenue, bought one of the PX buildings and had the structure moved in several pieces to a lot near their store. There it went into service, not as a music hall, but as the Perryman Theater. I recall uh, when it was moved to the site at that particular time you had the uh, you didn't have the zoning situation so you could put these kind of establishment into a neighborhood and there was a, a dirt road going on both sides of it and it was put into the neighborhood especially for black folk at that particular time because we couldn't go to the other theaters. The Perrymans plan to attract black moviegoers on the south side of town installing a cement floor projection room in the north end of the building. One of Perryman's sons, William Alexander Perryman, ran the projector. One of the things about theaters uh, back in the day when the film were flammable is that every theater had to have a, a cement room to place them in so that they wouldn't ignite, actually. There aren't many theaters left that have preserved that room. We have preserved it. So just behind those real 
windows up top, you will see uh, the, the room that is completely concrete block. And that's sort of unusual because this entire building is made of wood, of course. But we're preserving that room uh, because we, we know now that it is a historical piece. Wooden theater seats were installed and posters in front advertised the coming attractions. This don't concern you. I don't like to see human beings getting tramped by a horse. Westerns featuring Hopalong Cassidy and Johnny Mac Brown were popular with the local children, though they would often have to wait a little longer to see their cowboy heroes. They would show the movies after they show it to the uh, white theaters at that time, theaters that we weren't going to. Then oh, maybe if the movie come out uh, in January, well, possibly after it's been shown quite some time, we'll get to see it. Maybe sometime October, November. <laughs> the cost of the film uh, become cheaper after it's been shown for quite some time and it first come out. It'll go to the white theaters. While the Perrymans couldn't give moviegoers first run Hollywood movies, they did offer something most local theaters did not all black cast features. You'd be looking for a new partner. Look at that. Pretty, ain't she? Pretty? Why, man, she's beautiful. Look at those eyes. We did have the, uh, some of the uh, westerns, the films that would come in. And they would have, um, at that particular time, we didn't have a number of uh, black films. Um, Anyway, the one that we had, we did get those ones that we did get. A lot of Westerns, I recall. The theater, however, was not as successful as the Perrymans had hoped. It stopped screening movies around 1949. But the building would not remain vacant for long. It was purchased by Charles and Sarah McKnight. Sarah was a local musician, and she and Charles would rechristen the theater the Cotton Club after the famous Harlem night spot and began presenting black entertainers to enthusiastic audiences. The club had no trouble attracting black artists. When the big band era existed, big names came through. And therefore, it was a spot, a meeting spot, for a lot of people, especially African Americans. At that time, there was a, a thing called a Chitlin Circuit. The Chitlin Circuit was the collective name given to the string of music and performance venues throughout the eastern and southern United States that booked black musicians, comedians, and other entertainers in the age of segregation. Artists like Count Basie, Sarah Vaughn, Lionel Hampton, Nat King Cole, Big Joe Turner, and Cab Calloway. All of the black artists, they couldn't, they weren't playing in Las Vegas and, you know, the Copacabana and all that. They were playing in venues like this. And so they worked the whole circuit, this club being part of the circuit. These were the uh, only kind of places that they really had opportunities to, to play was uh, uh, venues in, in, in the black community. Very rarely were they invited to come and play at the... Uh, clubs uh, um, in, in, in white neighborhoods. Uh, uh, as you know, it was the late 60s before you started to see a black person on Ed Sullivan every now and then. So back in the 50s, there was even less opportunity. So this was, this was it. This was how they had to make their living. The only, only two avenues you had, you either heard them on a record on the jukebox, because there weren't very many black stations, and in a place like North Central Florida, there were absolutely no black radio stations. Uh, we used to have to listen to a station out of Nashville, Tennessee. So your jukebox, the one or two stations that you might encounter, and the uh, local clubs was it. There were other circuit stops in the area, but Gainesville's Cotton Club was particularly important for a very practical reason. When they would come to this area, they would play Lottie. There was a club up in Lottie. They would play here, they would play down in O'Keller.
they would base out of here because at that time there was a black hotel in town. So they had somewhere that they could stay and work the whole area. And then when they finished this area, then they move on down south and then make the circuit on around. Before long, the Cotton Club built a reputation, bringing an impressive list of black entertainers to grace its stage. Bo Diddley, Brooke Benton, Rufus Thomas. And the club brought in large crowds as well. Though it was located adjacent to Mount Olive African Methodist Episcopal Church, there were never any problems between the church and the increasingly popular Cotton Club. Vivian Filer was a young girl at the time. It was a wonderful neighborhood, quiet except for the times uh, when there was a lot of activity around here. I don't remember any problems with that because people respected the church. So if something was happening here, it was on Saturday night. It would never be on Sunday morning when uh, there was something going on at the church. I never heard of any conflicts uh, uh, during that era. It was on a dirt street. Didn't have any parking regulation that you had at this time. You just parked on the street or wherever you can find a place to park. People just parked. That was the only place in the particular area then that we could go to. And they had such bands as, uh, you know, uh, James Brown, B.B. King. The times that our group played here, the high notes, those were my fondest memories of this building. When I'd walk into the Cotton Club, I'd feel like I was, I probably feel like I was in New York City. I was just so thrilled when we all young people would get together. <laughs> we used to have a good time there. I was young and I was jumping, but I can't jump no more like I did. I was young and I was drunk and they'd have dances to come. B.B. Kane came with us. Cars were parked on each side of the road, and uh, <laughs> there was a scramble to get in because there were mostly advanced tickets and all that sold. And as I'm telling you now, they were sold as far away as Ocala, 38 miles away. When Gene Brown played here, we all was excited, and when we'd go in the club, first somebody we'd be looking for was Gene Brown. We'd be looking to see him on the stand, and he could sing. And he, I mean, he could sing, he could dance. James Brown was uh, a great dancer, and he danced in his performances along with his music. B.B. King uh, was a different story. He didn't dance, but uh, he had uh, his guitar. Lucille was his uh, <laughs> favorite instrument. He, everybody loved to hear that. Ray Charles played here. To play again, that's not likely, but uh, to even show it to someone else, a visit would be quite a good experience. As the Cotton Club's popularity grew, so did the McKnight's plans for the club. There was talk of adding a balcony similar to the one at Ocala's Black Knight Club, Club Bally. Crowds continued to grow with patrons coming from as far as Platka and Jacksonville, and some were coming from Gainesville's white community, including students and faculty from the University of Florida and members of the UF football team. During that particular time, there were some whites who would come in to the Cotton Club, but then the uh, blacks couldn't go into the <laughs> to the uh, whites at that particular time because of the segregation. But this was because some of the noticed known artists who would come through were white would want to see them also. Some have speculated it was the club's growing popularity in the white community which may have led to its eventual downfall, suggesting the McKnight's license to operate the club was not renewed because of opposition to social interaction between the races. You must remember during this particular time they had this was a segregated situation. You couldn't go to the uh, downtown establishment, uh, the white establishment, because it was a segregated uh, society and it would be a uh, law, state law, city law. You could see how strong this was. So any entertainment that black folk had had to be established for whites by, for black. Or it was for black exclusively and not for whites. And the white had that and the black had that. We were in a community where uh, most of the black lived in certain parts of the community. And this was an establishment 
that was in the black community for black folk. Whatever the case, Gainesville's Cotton Club closed its doors sometime in the mid-50s and reopened as the Blue Note, a juke joint which sold beer, offered plenty of room to dance, and a jukebox as well as live music. The Blue Note was then more or less a club-like situation. And we attended there also, and it was a, on the establishment, one of the establishment that was large enough to uh, have uh, entertainment, band, dances at that particular time. In fact, the Blue Note is described as the Blue Note ballroom and telephone directories from the time. But it too would not last. In 1959, the building was sold to Kenneth Gibbs and used as a warehouse for the Babcock Furniture Company. When I was a child, the building was a warehouse. And uh, at that time, all the furniture came in big cardboard boxes. So when they would get in new furniture and throw the boxes out, we'd take the boxes and play with them, make forts and that kind of stuff out of them. In 1970, Babcock Furniture left, and the building, like many once vibrant clubs on the Chitlin circuit, was left abandoned. Few of them remain today, and few of the performers are still performing. Blues artist Willie Green remembers the circuit, having hitchhiked and hopped freight trains to go into town to listen to now legendary blues performers like Jimmy Reed, and later going on to play some of the same juke joints himself. Today he plays weekly at the Yearling Restaurant in Cross Creek. We were hitting them hunker tons joint there, and what that much money be made, but we had fun. Otherwise, we learned from all of that. Blues, I think, what I needed. It's what I needed. And blues helped me out a whole lot, playing the blues. And that's what I, that's what I chose, what I really chose to do. I think that was for me to do that. And that's why I'm sticking with the blues. All of the little towns around here, had jokes. There was uh, Ross Brothers at Jonesville. There was Go Go Club uh, in Hawthorne. There was um, um, see what uh, the Waldo Country Club. Uh, so all all around here, and they, they had the little spots where people used to congregate and uh, uh, music would be played, food would be sold. You could go to all these places, and you could have entertainment, get a meal, and that was the fabric of the community. Today there is an effort to mend that fabric by restoring the most celebrated of Gainesville's black clubs, the Cotton Club. The Cotton Club is going to be the, the kindling wood for, for this area. Uh, I know others have said and I agree that they're go we're going to be the, the place where people sprout out from. Other good things will happen. And good things have been happening since the building and adjoining property were acquired by Mount Olive African Methodist Episcopal Church. Our pastor at the time had so much vision, she came to the board and said to us that children, you need to get the land because they're making a lot of things these days, but they're not making more land. And that was her way of telling us, get it now because it won't be there for you later. And so the board, the church, the, the church board decided that we should purchase this. And when we purchased it, it was her desire that we turn this into something that would meet the needs of the community. It was started by their former pastor, uh, Reverend Thelma Young, who is now the presiding elder. And as current pastor, we support uh, this project. Um, it is on the land of Mount Olive AME Church. And uh, the church is excited about what's happening in the community and uh, the resurrection of its own culture. The preservation and resurrection of the neighborhood is a key component of the Cotton Club Museum project. The idea has been building momentum and gathering support from a broad cross-section of the Gainesville, Alaska County community. I like the idea of the, uh, the Cotton Club and restoring it as a cultural center. Have you seen another uh, African-American culture center in the community? I haven't. And I think this will be very good for the African-American community, and I think it will be a very good time for the rest of us to learn about the African-American community. In serving with the board of directors, uh, all of the persons that are on that board really represent a lot of areas in the community. We have you know, community leaders, we have faith-based leaders, we have uh, educators, and everybody that's on that board is just so passionate about uh, this particular project. 
And so it really is a joy uh, to work with uh, a diverse group of individuals who are really committed uh, to one central uh, mission, being a partner and representing uh, Santa Fe College. Um, as an educational institution, uh, we're always excited about you know, bringing knowledge to any community for we know that knowledge is power. The preservation of this kind of building and this kind of culture is just so important to this state. And we've got a little piece of it that we can help with that on this side of town. The Cotton Club just seems to fit right into that preservation of heritage and culture that we really need to do, not only for historical purposes, but for the people in this community. And helping the community to remember its past can lead to a brighter future. When I heard about the project and heard about the reason for the existence of the project and the goals of the project, one of which is to at some point gather things which will tell the history of African Americans in Gainesville and also the history of African Americans in general, it was a special interest for me. Much of what we know about this building, as is true of much of African American history, is from oral history from what people remember, what they tell us, what they pass on through the stories that we've heard from people who were actually here. Uh, historic preservation is a living thing. It's not just preserving old buildings. Uh, it actually is a, a device, really a catalyst for restarting uh, communities that have been uh, depressed uh, by uh, returning people to the roots, what made the community important getting people excited about their sense of place in a community, and uh, taking that into the future. So what does the future hold for the Cotton Club Museum and Cultural Center and for the Spring Hill neighborhood? Once the project is finally realized, this is going to be a, a big plus. It's going to enhance the neighborhood because it's already done that so far. Uh, things are starting to improve. Uh, the area has been... Um, uh, rid, uh, written of uh, the various types of uh, people that were hanging around the negative types. Uh, you have a police presence in here that uh, monitors the area, so we can see a lot of positive things happening for the community. We're going to be helping our local community, and the Powell Center actually has a long history of doing that. And it's always enormous satisfaction to work with members of, of the community, to work with the African American neighborhoods, and to work together to try to make life better for everybody in the city of Gainesville. This building is one of a kind. There is no sister to it in the county, I don't, maybe in the state, but not in the county, where we can actually go, we've been at the African American community in our own neighborhood and plan a big event. This building with a stage will seat auditorium style 300 people. So we see weddings here, we see ourselves bringing in different types of music, picking a genre maybe and focusing on it in the fall and switching to another one in the spring and bringing in big names to really focus on the cultural aspect. But we're not stopping just with the musical piece. We see all of the art spectrum being a part of this community. Taking that essence, as it were, the essence of the building and coupling it with um, a sustainable program and bringing it back as a community center will provide Spring Hill a foothold in its rebirth. The other uh, four buildings surrounding it, the four shotgun houses, represent an insight into a part of Gainesville that has almost disappeared. So the preservation of those is equally important and will eventually represent um, a vignette of life in Gainesville 40, 50 years ago, which has changed a lot over the years. A lot of those changes, changes for the better. Segregation is now a thing of the past, but so are clubs like the Cotton Club, which makes preserving the building and its story that much more important. The history of the building itself, in terms of the era during which it was built and how it was built and then moved here to Gainesville, the architecture of the building itself, the materials with which it was built, but it also has a significance because of its use in the community the purposes for which it was used, the impact that it has had on the community. I'm very proud to have the Cotton Club down there. Very proud to have it. I was really glad and excited when I got the news that they were going to have it done. Stuff like this, you know, in the community, yeah, everybody is, is drawn to it. Yes, I do. I miss it very much. We have a lot more work to do, but we're excited 
we're always excited. Every little step we take is a big step, and, and we herald it, and we thank all of the people who have given, because there have been really great people. The, the roof on this building, uh, the funds to buy it was given to us by the pantry, uh, the $20,000 for that, uh, and all of the labor to put the roof on was done by Perry Roofing. They came out and spent an entire Saturday just putting the roof on this building, but we accept all kinds of contributions. They aren't any too small, certainly not any too large. <laughs> Welcome to your Alachua County Library District, where we're thinking outside the book. What does the library have for you? DVDs, videos, software, music, CDs, and it's free. Wireless hotspots at every branch, all for free. Friendly assistance, online databases, it's also free. And of course, books on every subject, large print and more, all at the best price, free. The library has free research databases with access from home or the library. The Alachua County Library District, thinking outside the book. Trouble near as a truck overloaded with usable items approached a dumpster. <laughs> By trashing all these reusable wares, the landfill is certain to overflow. Lights and sirens glared at the Waste Watcher lair. The Waste Watcher? Not again! Scooping up the discarded items, he redistributed them to charity drives and consignment shops across town. You've not seen the last of me! Remember, folks, embrace zero waste. Reuse whenever possible. For more tips, contact the Waste Watcher today. All over America, people are taking the National Radon Test. Have you? <laughs> you put me on the spot! Have you heard of radon? I've never, I never thought about it. I don't know. I think it's a secret killer or a silent killer. Poison gas that seeps into the house. That's one of the tests we did with the inspector before buying the home. Why worry about it? Why worry? Take the National Radon Test. True or false? Radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer. True. I'd say false. No, it's true. I thought of cigarettes and then pollution. That's something new to me. Radon can penetrate a concrete block. It's false. False? False? It's true. I, I wouldn't know true. how they could protect you from that. It's scary. The Office of the Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested for radon. False? It's true. True? I should know about it because I worked in the hospital for many years. So that's bad. We should get our house tested. Sure, I'll call it. 1-800-SOS-RADON. How can you not call? 1-800-SOS-RADON. <laughs> R-A-D-O-N.